Welcome to Black Man Lab. We are live um, on a great Monday evening with some great topics tonight. We are talking about uh, the gaming industry. And uh, I know from having talked to a lot of younger folks out there, there's a lot of interest in the gaming industry. So we want to uh, bring that to them and be able to talk about uh, where there are opportunities and, and, and uh, how they can delve into it. Um, but before we get started, well, one of the things that we do every week is some traditional stuff. First of all, Black Man Lab started uh, roughly four years ago. Uh, with brother Molly Davis and, and um, one of my other brothers here that's on the panel with me tonight, uh, brother Jared Grant and a couple of other brothers got together with their sons. Because uh, we know as fathers, sometimes our sons don't necessarily listen to us, but they might listen to an uncle or to a godfather, a good friend. Um, so that's what happened. That environment got put together and uh, it grew from there, it grew to being um, when we start doing this live and in person. Of course, we're virtual tonight, but when we are in person, we're normally at the Andrew uh, and Walter Young YMCA. And uh, we've had, well, we get over 250 young men and, and, and grown men in the room together to be able to talk about um, different subject matter, whether that's from a career standpoint or, or a um, self-development standpoint. We're doing that every week, every Monday, and we've been very consistent with that. Um, right? uh, we are virtual, of course, and what virtuality does is it gives us the ability, ability to bring in some folks that we would normally be able to get into the space if they weren't in town um, or, or available uh, to get to the location. Um, so before I go any further, we have some other traditional things that we do um each week and it's work on making sure we are centered and ready to take on the information of the evening so with that i want to bring on my brother jared grant um to to help to get us started brother grant you're muted jared greetings brothers and uh welcome to black man lab we really thank you all for being on the program um we like to also um, invite or place into our hearts and memories, uh, our ancestors. Uh, so we wanna take a, a moment to think about some of those ancestors, some of our great ancestors, and put them in our hearts and mind and remember some of the great things that they've done for us, put us in the place that we are today um, in assisting and supporting um, our work and so take about a few seconds just to think about uh, some of our great ancestors. And lock that into your heart and mind and everybody raise their fists. And on the count of three, we're gonna say Ashe. One, two, three, Ashe. Okay. And then I want you to think about your own ancestral line. Uh, how were you created? I mean, who created you? I mean, those people were significant and important to how you got here. And therefore you're standing on the, on the shoulders of folks in your own bloodline. So think about your own ancestral line right now. Just give a few seconds and put them into your hearts and mind. And then everybody raise their fists and everybody say Ashe three times. Ashe, 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 Ashe. Ashe. Thank you, brothers, and, and, and lock those ancestors in your hearts and minds. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jared. Um, again, as, he, as Brother Jared said, we, we're standing on all those shoulders that came before us. So it's important for us to uh, acknowledge those people um, and their spirit and make sure that it's in this space as we work, continue the work that, that they did prior to us. The other thing that we do every week um, is we, when we're together, we reach out. Um, to, to those that need it. What I mean by that is we say, hey, is there anybody here in the audience that can use some Black Man Lab love? And inevitably we have some folks that raise their hand. And what we mean by that is, um, you know, we may have had a rough day, we may have had a rough week, a rough month, or a rough year, or even further a rough life. And we don't ask any questions. We just let that person come up front and we give them a hug our arms around them and let them know that we are here for you. And so we wanna make sure that those of you that are listening tonight know that we are here for you. Uh, we, we are here to uh, make sure that we are 
able to wrap our arms around you and send you love because we know that sending love out um, does help people to carry on. So we want to make sure that that's there as well. Without any further ado, I want to go ahead. We have a decent sized panel tonight, so I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to share their gifts. Um, so what I want to do real quick, just go around the horn and give every let everybody give themselves an introduction. Just so your name and and you know what got you to where you're at in the gaming industry. So um, I'll start with uh, brother Kevin Fair. Hit that young on mute button. What's going on? Thank you so much, Marty, for having me. Glad you're here, brother. Um, so I'll share really quickly. Um, I have enjoyed video gaming my entire life. And it's funny that, you know, I'm here on a show called Black Man Lab. And uh, realistically, it's been the way that I bonded with my, my brother. And uh, the first person that really introduced me to gaming in that way or someone that I was able to share with was my older cousin, who's been like a male role model for me my entire life. So um, for me, gaming very much starts at the ability to bring people together and enjoying something. And so, uh, yeah, no, a lot a lot of my positive male relationships definitely have inspired me in, in a lot of different ways to share what I do, um, not just as a uh, business owner, but also as a uh, as a facilitator for workshops around gaming, specifically for um, teens, um, teens, high schoolers, all in that mix of the middle school or kind of age range. Primarily, my company provides uh, key solutions, turnkey solutions for video game events. So you go, hey, great, man, I need 50 PlayStations, Kevin, and they all got to have 2K on it. You imagine how many updates I get to do during the week, right? Have a lot of fun with that. At the same time, um, I have a ball because once again, I enjoy video games. The company itself not only helps you plan the event, so uh, understanding how a tournament will work, how that fits uniquely into your event. We're there to consult you on that. And then the cherry on top is that we come on site to help you execute it. So, you know, the actual moderation of said event, we provide the staff and for that as well. And then, you know, some people said I had a decent sounding voice. So I try to do some emceeing from here and there. All right. Good stuff, man. And we'll delve deeper into, you know, what you, you're doing and what got you there. Uh, but appreciate, appreciate the, uh, the information. Brother Brian Jackson. Well, first of all, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I've been in two different uh, gaming industries. Um, the first industry I was in, I was in the video game industry. Um, I was in the video game industry for about 20 years working for companies like EA and Microsoft and Bethesda Softworks. Um, and then a, a smaller startup called Energize Entertainment down in New Orleans. Um, but now I'm here in Atlanta and I'm actually working in the casino gaming industry. So I'll get into, I can go into both sides of that as we go on today. Awesome. Appreciate that. And that's, a, well, you know, so often we think about gaming and we're thinking about video games um, as it relates to the Xbox or PA, uh, PS2 or whatever. Um, there's also gaming on, on other levels as well in terms of gambling as well. So thank you for that. Um, my brother KB. You're on mute there, brother. You still on mute, KB. Unmute. Well, there you can go. You hear me now? All right, yep, we can hear you. Sorry about that. Um, but I'm KB. Um, I'm a. Uh, I'm from South Georgia, but I'm. Uh, I've been in Atlanta for over ten years now. Uh, I am a gamer first and foremost. Um, gaming has been monumental in my life. Uh, it it has done like so much for me. Um, second, I'm a content creator. Um, um, I basically create content around gaming and a bunch of different uh, other dope things. Uh, I'm also a host of a podcast, where's the KB Podcast, and I'm a stream coach. So with that, I like to usher uh, people into the gaming industry. So if they want to get into streaming or anything gaming related, um, I'm the guy to kind of talk you into it and motivate you in, into it and get you into that industry. Um, so I love everything gaming. Like I like a lot of I game almost every day. So um, I just love it. I'm, I'm really appreciative to be on this panel tonight. Awesome. Appreciate that, brother. Thank you. Um, brother Stephen Churn.
Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. So uh, first off, man, I'm, I'm honored to be here with all you brothers, man. Uh, I, I've, I've been to the Black Man's Lab before in person. Um, and it's just it's, it's no other feeling like it, man. Um, room full of that positive. Um, you know, you can't get it anywhere else. Uh, but yeah, man, I, I wanted to uh, just like the first brother. Uh, gaming is something that I as a huge part of my life. It was used as a, as a mechanism to, to kind of connect. Uh, I'm talking about go all the way back to we in apartments on, on the porch, everybody bringing they, their games and we just playing. Um, and as I got older, it was intro and, you know, keeping cousins and, you know, online gaming. Uh, you know, whether they were in the service, uh, we played games all the time, uh, ver uh, just online. So the way I, I kind of got into the industry uh, is that, uh, you know, I, I love games. I play games every day. Um, but uh, a few years ago, I started a small company called Churn Interactive. And um, I just wanted to see about developing a game, a mobile app game. So I made a mobile app game called Rumblebee. Um, and submitted it to the Google Play Market. It, it got accepted. And right now it's like almost like five stars right now. And it's an old game, uh, but it was a way so all my nephews and nieces and every little kid I know, you know, they could play the game. And um, I use that uh, with the, I have a youth organization called I Am College and we do STEM programming, award-winning STEM program. So I use that as a tool to kind of show these kids, like, listen, you can make your own game you can create your AdSense account and you can get paid off of something that you guys do anyway. Mm. Um, and, it, and it doesn't require, you know, college education. It doesn't require a whole lot of tools. You could do that right now. Um, so we kind of uh, introduced that through our STEM programming. And um, as of lately, before the pandemic hit, uh, you know, we try to keep our program innovative. We started really looking into programming um, with the esports world, right? So we, we uh, you know, did an event at Georgia State, uh, Dreamcast, and we started making connections and uh, creating a, a, a partnership so that we can get some of our young gamers. Because now the whole, the whole thing has changed. You can actually make money off of gaming. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so we were trying, we are uh, in the process of, of creating uh, a program to kind of get these kids that, that are really good in and want to see it as a passion and connect them to the right people so that they could probably do something with it. So. Uh, yeah, so that's that's where I'm at with it. Awesome, that's that's great stuff. Cause um, I, I, well, I'll say this: we'll come back to you with that because I, I have a lot of questions that I think a lot of young folks out there are interested in comes in terms of developing games. So um, thanks so much for that, um, brother Sam Russell. Can't find PS Five, Russell. Hey, how is everybody doing? Um, I think it's an honor for being on, though, being on the count, uh, the council, and thanks to my buddy uh, Stephen Turner. Uh, we've known each other for quite a long time back when we were uh, we was in school, we were undergrad. We was at Albany State down in Albany, Georgia. So we've been great good friends, and he kind of put me on today. He sent me the link, said, "You know, join in to see how this panel was." And my life, like I said, I've been an avid gamer for years. Like I said, I, I want to date back, going back to playing the. Odyssey in the Coleco Coleco vision back in the day, and my like I said, my area of dealing with the games has been very vast over the years. Has gone for back. I have um, mainly been a part of the arcade the arcade room realm, and which back in my like I said, I think um, I think Kevin's um, it was Kevin or FKB say from Southwest South Georgia. I'm like I said, I'm originally from Albany, Georgia. That but I moved up into the um, Atlanta area, and a couple of back you know years ago, we had some friends that you know we wanted um, we started some arcade had some arcade rooms back uh, back in Albany, and we had little arcade rooms in which everybody would game you know facilitate, and I've got friendships that I've been with friends that we you know had you no know, played in game rooms for back for 30 years and still we're friends now even since the arcade you know the arcade room realm has pretty dissipated to more of a online gaming gaming now mm -hmm. but um over the years like i said i've just been really into games and like i said i'm really happy to be up and on part of this council you know just to see how everybody's involved with uh, technology and in the gaming industry thank you so much brother appreciate that um with that, man, I want to get started on the first question that I, I'm going to give to you guys is one that I'm, I've heard often um, from, from the young folks, young brothers specifically, that are looking to get into 
um, developing games. We've had a lot of young brothers that have come to me before and said, hey, you know, my thing is I want to create games. I want to create video games, whether that's on a computer or to get to the, the you know, high-end console um, realm, such as Xbox and PlayStation and so on. What would you say is the first thing if somebody says, hey, I have an idea for a game and they want to create what would you say is the first thing that they should do? And I, I'll start with uh, Brother Steven. I'll start with you. All right. So uh, one of the first things that they can do um, first, you know, have the ideal of the game, have the concept of the game, see if it's anything like that. Um, and you said something interesting. Um, young guys, they think it's, it's this big, you know, thing to develop a game and you don't have to start big. It's a lot of indie games on these platforms that the graphics aren't realistic. They're cartoony or they're, they're pixels or, you know, uh, sprites. A lot of ways you can start with the baby steps. So one of our, uh, one of the guys that was in our program, he, um, now he's going on to be a game developer. Uh, he, he does the indie, you know, indie game developer. He started with making sprites. And if you don't know what sprites are, sprites are um, just little characters that you make um, that are just really just a few pixels. Some of the older games are reminiscent of some of those older games where you couldn't really see the detail. You just see the little man. Um, and they created, you know, learning the, the mechanisms behind the games, learning how to, you know, uh, uh, program objectives and, and how everything works. Um, and a lot of this stuff now, the information is out there. Um, it's free game engines. I built my game in, in, a, in a game engine called Unity. Um, and a lot of it, like it's the information is out there. And just like Google Play, it's a lot of these free platforms for them to test out and just build and try um mit app builder um it's a lot of different platforms but the first thing i would say just just do some research um and, and try baby steps look for anything that doesn't require a lot of software something that's free um and just create a simple game just get started just create a very simple game and then grow from there awesome and um somebody else can answer this part of the question you know, once we develop that game, what's the next step, though? So I developed the game, so what's next? Um, anybody anybody want to jump on that? I'll, I'll jump on that real quick. Uh, once again, this is Brian Jackson. But even before what, what Steven said, there's, a, there's another step that I always tell people if they're interested in making an app or making a game is make sure it's your idea. And what I mean by that is you – there's ways that you can go to get certain things trademarked, registered, you know, because when I was working at EA, people would call me all the time and say, hey, I got this great game idea. And I tell them, do you have an NDA? Because if you tell me this idea, we can run with it and there's nothing you can do about it. So you have to protect yourself first, you know, and that's something that um, I'm, I'm sure that everybody else is aware of, but maybe some of our listeners aren't aware of. So when, it's, when it's, you're talking about creating a game, make sure that you protect what's your idea because if so, if you go through all the steps that, that Steven brought up and you make this game and then you say, Hey, I want to do, I want to let some people test it out and you send it out to a couple people. If they copyright or trademark or do something like that, that's part of your idea. You're going to have to end up paying them for your idea. Hmm. So that's one thing you need to keep in mind as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Brian, this is Molly Davis, man. Thank you. What What is an NDA? Just so that our listeners know what an NDA is. NDA is a non-disclosure agreement, which means that you both people have to sign the document beforehand so you can have a conversation between that person and whatever you discuss has to stay between you and that person. Gotcha, gotcha. It's funny, you had the lawyer asking you to do some lawyer talk. <laughs> um kb what about you anything else that you can think of um uh, yeah only? yeah i would say just you know the 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 biggest the biggest thing i would say is just uh kind of how steven said just you just got to kind of jump into it you can't get bogged down in the details and you just have to jump into game development it's something you just kind of have to make that leap of course protect yourself legally with the ndas and like I said, all the information is there. You can find an NDA template online. You can use that 
and it's good. You know what I'm saying? You can get a lawyer to check that out and make sure it's fine. You can use that and start talking about your idea. And I think it's important to talk about your idea, develop your idea, write it down. Like you need to visualize that idea before it can actually be something, you know, and start simple baby steps. And, you know, that's I'm just piggybacking off of what uh, Brian and Stephen already said. Sure. Good stuff. Um, let, let me ask this also on this kind of the same same subject. So once that's developed, once once we have a game, I we have do everything that you guys just talked about. Once developed, then what? How does it how does it come to fruition through a platform? Anybody can answer that. One. So I'll just throw some some information that I'm able to come up on, even though I personally have not developed a video game yet. Um, I work frequently with a number of different groups that pull together their own games. And uh, a couple of guys got their steam green light. I'm proud to say that I was in the game somewhere, made a little bit of a cameo and whatnot. Um, but that's really what a lot of these things come down to is getting onto a platform really has a number of different hoops that you got to jump through. And I think more of the guys in the indie space find themselves jumping on a platform called Steam for some of the users at home. Think of it as your Xbox Live that exists on your on your personal computer, right? It's a service that you can download and really kind of, you know, choose from a library of games. And what you'd be doing is you'd be applying for space on Steam. And they review a number of different things. There's a lot of information that you have to give. But there are people with games that simply consist of pictures. I've got a buddy who has a game that is a uh, more like a detective puzzle game where text pops up on the screen. You type in the answer. So, you know, I think um, Steve, KB, all of them have put up some really good information to kind of break people's mind away from this idea that if you're going to create a game, it has to be a triple A title. And what I mean by triple A title is got to look like Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> God of War. You have to have, you know, somebody do some 3D rendering and animation for you. And games simply don't have to. I just finished a class where we were playing the game Among Us. And if you guys get a chance, look up Among Us. Someone drew a circle stick figure and they're walking around on a 2D plane that, you know, I think somebody seven year old could have drew it. But it's been a wildly successful game because the way you interact on it works. And once again, it's one of those games that was placed on the Steam network first. So, hey, Marty, if you're saying, hey, I just finished the game. I got some folks that have signed some NDAs and they uh, have taken a look at my game. They had a lot of fun with it. I'm ready to go Steam green light on it. You can um, I think that is probably for for most indie developers, people who don't have huge pockets to try to publish something or go through the rigorous process of trying to get on the playstation network or the xbox live arcade store um, steam is a really great option for indie developers who have made a product and they want the world to play it and uh they can really in a lot of ways set their own price as well so those are all things i think kind of positively you know Absolutely. allow you to get it out there you said something too that i wanted to uh just come circle back to so see yeah, steam is a vast platform. Um, I play virtual reality games in Steam. Um, they have a lot of like off the, you know, crazy, weird, like type of games. But um, once you create the game, making sure that it's fun, that you enjoy it is, is huge. Um, I noticed when uh, early on, I know you guys probably may remember the piano game, right? And people were making all these different variations of it. Uh, but if you didn't enjoy the game and you were just chasing that, it was going to be a short lived thing. So making sure that you enjoy it, uh, making sure that it's something that you're proud of, proud of and understand, because once you start transitioning to, like you said, these platforms, these indie platforms, they have certain regulations, certain stipulations to how to rate the game. And you may have to make some changes, but, you know, knowing what I guess what is the core of that game and what you really find, like what you really enjoy about it. Um, you can make those adjustments. But like you said, uh, it's, it doesn't take a lot. Um, and, and people have to understand, like, these AAA title games have whole studios behind them. They have, like, people on on different continents working towards this one game. So, mm -hmm. of course, the the uh, the the value of the game or, or the look of the game, of, of all the aspects of the game are going to be highly rated. These companies are putting millions of dollars in it. But the the, the, the big leveler is, it just has to be fun. It has to be enjoyable because some of these companies, man, pour all this money and we've all seen games flop. 
And when they flop, they flop hard. And, it, you know, they, sometimes they try to over innovate. Sometimes they just miss core mechanics. But if you have a simple game, like you said, with the stick and the person, if it's fun, some of the best and wildly creative, uh, wildly successful games have been very simple, but very fun and addictive. So that's something that you can't like get away from. Yeah. One thing I want to add, add on to that also, Stephen, was as far as the, the big AAA titles that that you were speaking of as well. I worked for a, um, a startup company in in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and we were the first African-American uh, gaming company to get a game put on the Xbox 360. So I know all about getting going from not being a certified Microsoft developer to becoming a certified Microsoft developer <laughs> and going through all those hurdles and then doing the same thing for Sony and then for uh, Nintendo. And then after that, even if you're a certified developer, that doesn't mean that your product is going to make it you could, because you're a, just because you're a developer doesn't mean that you can actually submit a game to Microsoft because only certified producers can, I mean, uh, publishers can send games to Microsoft, which we didn't know when we first got started. So we spent all this money getting a developer's license, getting the dev kits, building everything, built the game. And they were like, oh, you guys don't have a publisher? Oh, we can't help you right now because only publish to get a game on our system, you, could, you have to be a publisher. So then we had to shop our game around to different, different publishers before we could even get on the, uh, into Microsoft. Brothers, wow. let, me, let me, this is Molly Davis. Let me ask a couple quick questions. We have a lot of young people. I see brothers, Ikea is here from Chicago. We have a lot of young men who, who watch and are part of Black Man Lab. What educational path does a gamer take? Like, do, do you go to technical school? Do you go get a four-year degree? Or, you know, what, what do you all recommend? And how do you, you know, is it, do you treat it almost like you treat, um, say, the entertainment industry where people work a nine to five until they hit? Or, you know, just t talk a little bit about the educational path and the professional path that that you would recommend to our say 18 you know 19 20 year olds that are that are a part of black man lab well i can get my i can speak on a little bit since i i work like i said i'm i work for georgia state university and I, i'm it manager there for housing and i know i have a lot of grad students um that most of our grad students that are part of the computer science program there and what i've noticed that over the years Privy to when I was in school, computer science have made has made a big transition to giving you an option of what directions that you want to go in getting education. And I've noticed that there at we there are there is a now a path that they have as a um, game producer. I know at at Georgia State, in which they have courses dedicated that prepare a student uh, prepare a student to go into the realm of being a um, game producer and gives them you no know, direction of you know courses what they need as for programming what they need to know as putting the team together in order to get you know in order to get uh, the game get a game started now my only thing i'm not i haven't gotten any direct detail of how big the, 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 the um the direction you can go. Most people coming out of, like I said, coming graduating in that degree, not going to be, not going to get pulled on to, like I said, a triple A, a triple A game off the, you no, know, off the rip. A lot of them might, you know, start as, as a, on a lower platform or start on creating a game, you no, know, a personal game themselves to put out there to build up their, you know, build up their portfolio for other, you know, other studios to see them. But um, also, like I said, I have have a student as well, a grad student that decided to go into graphical design because that. That is a big that is a big key issue with some of these large games with, which graphics so i know grad students they did went into graphical design to pretty much get on the path of getting into some of these studios to be on the team in order to um you know to start it start in the area of creating graphics and programming what they want to do in that field I, i'll say too um first off uh i've been to georgia state the x labs like when i say these schools and this is take me to my point. Um, so we're talking about development of games, but some some young men want to be athletes. They want to play the games and win the competitions mm -hmm. and, and and be you know be like the Sonic Foxes and, and the different uh, celebrities that play these games and win these big cash rewards. Uh, so first off, uh, 
these schools are recognized that even, you know, official sports teams are recognizing like these, this esports is generating, especially during a pandemic is generating tons of money and they're investing in it. Georgia state had, if you've seen that movie, Redder player one, Georgia state, it's your, it's your guys X labs. Uh, before the pandemic hit, we took a tour. They have the machine where you can actually walk in virtual reality, like a little a bowl. So that's pretty cool. Um, with, with the development of our program, one of the guys that I was fortunate enough to meet, um, Avo works for Cox Communications. And um, he was, it's a guy that was in a, he's in a position to, uh, he's part of the innovation department with Cox Communications. And they purchased, when I said they purchased a team for Atlanta. So it's a game called Overwatch. And they, pu- they, pu- they purchased the team out of the West Coast. It's, it's called the uh, Atlanta Rain. And so the, basically these high schoolers living in a mansion are really good at that game. They bought the team like any other sports team, signed each of these students, each of these young high schoolers as like a, a athlete, like you, like you would sign anybody else. Um, but however, the thing is that when you play as an athlete, I think the, the, the pinnacle of most of the gamers, as far as your reflexes and your abilities and all of that, it's like 25, 20, 23, something like that. So you have a clock to be competitive in the industry. So they practice every day they practice strategies they they diet it's like if they these companies are investing in you don't think just because it's video games and you do it for fun that it's it's just you know fun no you are actually training like an athlete and and the way that they talked about these students these i'm I'm calling them students but the way they talked about these young esports gamers um it's like it, it was like rigorous like you you have a set schedule instead of you know hitting the weight room you're on that game and you're going through various scenarios because they're putting a lot of money in that. So uh, I know we were talking about development, but for those who are looking to um, get in it as an athlete, uh, you're going to have to put a lot of hours in. You have to put a lot of time in to get good. Um, I once met, and I, I'm not trying to capitalize, because I once met a gentleman, and this is one of the first, I, my first glimpse at competitive gameplay. I once met a guy uh, back at GameStop. I was working at GameStop a long, long, long time ago. And he he was one of the first it was a young black guy. and He was one of the first uh, champions at a game called Dead or Alive. And that was like one of the first uh, four years into like competitive gaming on television on like a, a show. And he told me like the amount is math involved in it, like frame rates and all these different things, you know, learning, learning a character. You know, when we punch, you see a punch, but they count the frames so they can be a consistent winner. And he was able to make enough money that paid for his uh, his when I say he paid for his, his his school all four years at Florida A and M, and he had like a nice apartment, you know, uh, uh, right on the corner, right across from the campus, and he was able to do that through gaming. So <laughs> it's it's a lot of opportunities, but it's it's not like oh you just good at the game. It's a as as you climb in that level, you're gonna meet some beasts out there that, <laughs> yeah. that you, you might be the best one in your family or your neighborhood <laughs> or your or your your network. But there's some people that all they do is play. All they do yeah. is play. And it, and, it, and it pays off. So, yeah, and, it, and, it, and to piggyback off some of that, so the answer to your question is not a straight line, right? Yeah. You don't have to go to college to learn how to code. You don't know have to go to college to learn how to do graphic design. You don't know have to go to college to learn how to produce these things. But going to school, you, you, you create, you, you meet people, you get in these communities, and they kind of reinforce you to create a product or something like that. So I were I partner with a, a a company called Community, and Community's main focus um, is to get uh, HBCUs and minorities into the gaming space. And when I say the gaming space, they touched on it a little bit, saying uh, you know, being an athlete in the gaming, you know, producing the games, developing the games, and also like streaming the games. Like they have the space of streaming now where you don't even have to be like an expert in the game. You can be <laughs> yep. a personality in the game. You can just be very knowledgeable about a game and people, pro- people and brands and businesses will pay you to, you know, represent their product. So it's, 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 it's about to be a, a, a crazy industry. It's, it's, it's set up to make a billion dollars this year. And, you know, COVID-19 was bad. It was terrible for a, a lot of people, but for the gaming industry, it, it, it went really well to, to, to say the least. So it's, it's just, it's just so wide and big, you know, we can talk about it forever, but it's so many different lanes you can get into now, whereas I think it's 82% of black teens play video games, 
but only 16% are involved in the industry, the gaming industry. So that number is, is something that community is trying to uh, uh, bring up, you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's, it's conversation like this will help, you know, black, black, black people realize that, oh, I can be a gamer too. Like, why is it all these white guys that's representing and why, why aren't we there if we, we all know people that game. Like we all know a gamer, somebody on 2K, somebody on this, I'm the best, but why are we not making the money doing it? You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying. Right. We need to get into this and get this money. So. Right. K- KB, um, and, and I don't know if Brother Zaki can hear us because I know Brother Zaki works with a lot of young people in the Chicago area. And one of his spaces is trying to get them to get their hands around this technology and the doors that that, that has opened. Brothers Zaki, I, I love for you to, to lean in on this a little because there are two things going in my mind. One, um, I like I would like to hear more about the educational piece that lead to opportunities. And then two, I think the million dollar question is, you know, show me the money. How like how how much a cat's making and, and you know, young sisters as well, but a parent you know, needs to know that if my my kid is in here, you know, it looks to me like they're just goofing around, you yeah. know, what, what what should I be telling them to say, okay, let's set some goals, let's set some milestones. Here's how, you know, here's what you could make if you reach this level, both what you can make as a developer, as a gamer, um, in the in the graphic design space, you know, give us some numbers, some ideas, so that um, us parents, us old school old heads, aren't just looking at them like, "Man, you tripping? Get your ass off that." <laughs> I, I appreciate that, brother. But um, I, I, I I'm in love with this conversation. I love the fact that we have young people out there listening. I kind of um, made that my life decision to work with the young people and as I began to see how do you build wealth and how do you um, find a a lifestyle um, in terms of financially and how do you actually make big money in your community, I realized that IT was was the career path that a lot of our young people are missing out on. And right now we are talking about um, diversity, inclusion and equity and everything that we do, especially in the tech space. And I have to, I'm not a gamer, but I know that I do cybersecurity. I, I, um, I fix computers. I, I, I build network systems. And you think about it, six years ago, I was a school teacher. I wasn't doing anything tech related. So I realized how I'm going to improve my quality of life, get in a, in a, in a career that's going to make me employed, but where I don't have to go looking for a job. A job is going to come looking for me. But... I realized that IT was a space that I want to be in. But when I realized if I'm pulling myself up, how do I pull the young people up that come come after me and my son included, I realized I got to build systems that our young people are going to be attracted to the IT space. And so I began to partner with um, other brothers like myself that want to be in the community, um, mining this talent and putting them on a career path that can take them from anything from robotics to, to cybersecurity to even gaming. And my, my counterpart here, Kevin Fair, when I, when I found out that um, Roosevelt University and IIT had one of the top gaming um, programs in the nation, I was like, man, they're giving scholarships. These young people are making hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of dollars in gaming a lot more than their tuition, I was like, let me find a brother who can kind of kind of expose some of these young people to that. And that's when uh, me and Kevin began to partner in Chicago. And Kevin, you could talk to them about the gaming industry and the, the universities and how they building these teams and they're competing as far as Japan and all these other places. And these, these young kids are probably making more than mm-hmm. some of our salaries mm-hmm. just playing video games. Brother Kev. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that one of the things you bring up uh, is so perfect to kind of talk about in this particular scenario. And so, um, Wally, what I want to try to do is comprehensively answer that question because you 100% right. When I get ready to start my workshops, I got two people in mind. I think about 
how do I make sure that the kid is having fun, but I also need to inform the parent on how this is, you know, something that is going to work for them in the future, right? How do I get a job out of this? How do I become a professional? What do I do in order to do that? And then once again, you know, the money is always in the greens, you know, how much am I taking home at the end of all of this? And so, you know, we think about these things definitely in comparison a lot of times to traditional sports, right? Why, why is everybody so, um, so, uh, um, so intent on making sure their kid makes it to the NBA or to the NFL? Well, because they already inherently know, well, at the core of it, the players make big, big money. But at the same time, we know that it teaches valuable skills beyond that, right? So for me, the gaming industry became something that I talked about holistically in that way, right? So... I don't tell a parent that, hey, you're going to be like the young man that won $3 million in Fortnite, right? The track to that is a very narrow road. The track to getting to being that good and making sure you have a splash and that kind of money is pretty slim. But on the other hand, though, I ain't never won nobody's tournament, but I started a company on being able to produce these types of events, consult groups on how to produce these types of events, and to be able to really kind of, you know, provide a good level of staffing. And everybody knows what electronic rentals go for. So I could give you the numbers on, hey, I know what I'm going to make on electronic rentals based on the amount of events that happen in this month, right? You know, so, you know, a parent will go, oh, in a given year, how much could you make? So, hey, I you know, I've had groups that have grossed 100000 on the lighting, the rent, and they're not a gaming company per se. They're not endemic to gaming, but that's how they keep their interest in something like that works. I could tell you that the average salary is $86,000 for a developer, but I also need you to know as a parent that you don't come out of college making $86,000 developing games. You end up beta testing and becoming a, a, a really great tester for games first as an entry level gig, which sometimes can be seasonal. That work can be seasonal. You could be working for nine months testing the game with the studio. For instance, we, um, um, Pat already mentioned, we're from Chicago. So we got NetherRealm, NetherRealm Games here. So we get a ton of my friends that go and work on NetherRealm's latest project or DLC, New Mortal Kombat coming out tomorrow, talk about it, um, that tested that. And guess what? They probably make close to forty five, fifty thousand dollars on just hey, I come in and that's not per one gig. That's, you know, a year, a year's worth of work on working on something together with a couple of different groups. So, you know, I know that's one way of talking about it. But I also try and make sure that people know about the different types of jobs that, um, you know, kind of branch out from this. I think KB is a really great example of someone who is able to use his ability as a personality and, um, and as, as a presenter first and foremost to say, hey, great, here's a way that you can represent your brand in gaming. Um, I think um, that consistently gets forgotten about, right? Um, in addition to that, I, once again, all I've done is organize tournaments. That's how I started my career in this. So I had a very deep and un a deep understanding of how uh, the tournaments in these game scenes work. And so, you know, uh, let me just going to flex real quick um, and go down the list real quick uh, so y'all can see virtually. Um, so I have, uh, you know, been able to host tournaments for uh, groups like C2E2 Repop, which puts on New York Comic Con. Uh, Courtyard Marriott was a client of mine when we worked directly with the NFL. I tried to call myself an NFL commentator because uh, Richard Sherman and them were playing a game that I got to commentate live and happening in that space. Chevrolet was a group that I consulted for their New York Comic Con activation. We ran an Injustice 2 tournament. And realistically, I popped in and said, here's how it will work based on you guys giving space. I couldn't beat none of those kids at Injustice 2. Well, I take that back. I could beat the children. When the pros came along, I handed off the sticks. But I wasn't going to win that tournament, but I was there to plan it. I was the consulting group that helped plan that, and they rented their entire system set up from me. Red Bull, all of the like Red Bull, I think also uh, for – for all my brothers there in Georgia, of course, I think they brought their Proven Grounds tournament to uh, to Atlanta as well. They hit 10 major cities. And we were the group that consulted them on the spaces here in Chicago as well. So, you know, I try to let parents know that we have to start thinking about video gaming beyond the two key things that we think of, which is you're either making a video game, which is important, don't get me wrong, or you're playing to win, uh, win money for these games. And those are just two things that you can be doing. Whereas I teach college courses on this. Um, colleges, once again, are giving away scholarships for this because they realize the potential in that. And the guys who used to be good players are now coaches. That's a career path in it. Um, I think the other part that we all 
also as especially as black men would be um, definitely behooved to talk about is the mental health aspect. Psychiatrists consistently get um, hired in the gaming space specifically so that kids that are playing these things are staying in a very good mental state and playing them. So I, I always try to see if I give um, a really good example of a breadth of different educational lanes that you can kind of go to to kind of express your passion and being a professional in the industry of video games. Let me ask one other question. I'm going to turn this back over to Marty, man. I just want to ask, you know, I'm always, you know, we have so many uh, Black legal organizations. You know, we have um, Black, um, the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys. We have the uh, Black Entertainment and Sports Law Association. So those collectives, right, of Black professionals with similar interests, where are those, what are those organizations that young people can plug into, their parents can plug into? You know, what are your suggestions around that? I know you all did, y'all talked about schooling. Um, and is there a HBCU that uh, we should be pointing, pointing our young people to that, that really focus on uh, gaming, developing, you know, just in this, in this space? So those are a two-part question. Anybody can just jump in and, and keep in mind, brothers, we have about 22 uh, minutes left. And uh, this is this is a powerful conversation because I'm learning so much. And I can add a couple of things here real quickly. So uh, I just put in the chat, uh, there's a Black uh, Game Makers Association that they really post a lot of great content and you can join them and you can actually talk to game makers and, and people who are developing games. Now you can get in with them and say, Hey, how can I help you develop this game? That's you learning right there. You don't need to go to college and you get live experience that you can use on a resume. You know what I'm saying? So you got to think about everything that you do. How can I use this to push myself further to my goal? So have you a goal in mind and try to find those little communities like he's talking about where you can get, get there. So that's, that's a big piece of it. Um, and I'll just leave it there. I, I, will, I will talk too long here. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, International uh, Game Developers Association, the IGDA, has chapters in most major cities and, and um, in some way, shape or form, that group is invented primarily to, I think, bring people who are, are novices and in coding into a network of people to, to, to really kind of talk about their ideas. Um, in a lot of different ways, they talk about, hey, so this is what, you know, my game is about. And the, um, just like anything else, the Nesbys of the world and whatnot, the NABJs, they discuss very frequently, you know, here's how I got to the point that I got to, right? Whether it be career-wise or a particular project. I think the other nice thing about uh, an organization like the IGDA is that they put on um, codathons and hackathons a lot for high school students that are interested in that type of thing. Um, so I think if you have a, a local IGDA chapter, um, they, you know, very much are always interested in trying to engage um, high schoolers, middle schoolers in a means of trying to bring them into the fold. And then, of course, if you get into it, you find out that you like it. I think it's very uh, I think it's very powerful for you to be able to talk amongst your peers um, or your colleagues professionally in that way. The uh, the uh, and I will say the HBCU space they are trying to make boards into uh, get it into this esports. Um, you can Google it. Uh, the under I think it's the undefeated. They are getting ready to launch. It's like an esports league that HBCUs have uh, ha have a, have a foot in there trying to get it. Uh, back to your, and really quickly back to your question about like parents. Um, I have a uh, one of the mentees in my when it was in my program. He was really good at games and he would go to competitions and he would win like, you know, small pot and his mother took interest in it. And she kind of, she kind of wrote it. It's one of those things that at a certain age, when your parents are into something, you kind of get off of it. Um, so that was one of the issues. So any, you know, anytime your child shows interest in something, take them to the events, take them to that, you know, help as a parent, you can help them by keeping them in that atmosphere. You know what I mean? Like if they want to go to a tournament, if they want to go to a class or they want to get that, you know, just like anything else, just encourage it and, and let it blossom like that and um, help them as, as best, you know, you can. If they need, uh, you know, money to get a developer's license or if they, you know, just want to start a business, like you said, and, and start a game truck, there's always avenues to, to, to provide support as a parent because uh, it's a lot of different avenues to being successful in this industry. And that's why it's growing so fast. And brothers, Thank you. This has been 
a lot of great information so far and it's spinning a whole bunch of questions in my head as as to Molly's point as, a, as one of those old folk it, now I probably consider myself that uh, thinking about different ways of doing this work right it's, in terms of the gaming industry um, from a business standpoint it sounds like um, there's a ton of different uh, um, avenues and, and, and lanes that you can go in um, Back to that HBCU piece, and as well as just college in general, um, there's is there right now any formal, you know, we have the NCAA for sports, right? So football, basketball, so on. So, is there anything like that yet for the for the um, for for college on any level? And then that's going to lead to my next question. But but is there anything out there like that right now that you all know of? I'm glad you brought that up. Because um, one of the things I was going to mention earlier was that there's this organization called the National Association of Collegiate Esports. And it lists over, um, let me think, um, who was speaking earlier? I think it was um, Stephen. I think he was talking about Overwatch. So for Overwatch alone, they offer, I mean, they, they have all the schools that offer scholarships just for playing Overwatch. And there's 111 schools just for Overwatch that offer scholarships to go. And some are Division One, like University of South Carolina, all the way down to Division Three. So, I mean, there, there are schools out there that are, that are paying attention. Um, unfortunately, on this list, there's not any HBCUs. And it's just because we're a little bit slow getting to that gate. But I guarantee within the next five years, there's going to be HBCUs that offer scholarships for that. Um, some uh, if you're into programming, there's schools that are that are geared specifically for the gaming industry. Um, there's one down in, down in in Florida. There's one in Texas. Um, I know the I know Southern Methodist offers a master's degree program in all different venues as far as the video game industry. So I mean, there's there's plenty of ways to get there if this is what you really want to do. Man, and that's yeah. that's exactly what I was getting at. Um, mm -hmm in terms of asking that question is that I'm sure with the breadth of what this industry is, that there would be that, there would be um, development of of, um, of leagues, if you will, from a, from a yeah. college standpoint. And we just don't know about it. So part of, yeah, I think it, what our, our challenge is, is to make that happen. But what were we gonna say, KB, I'm sorry. No, no, I was gonna say that, it, so it, it exists right now. Like, so working with community, uh, they started a HBCU esports league this year, so they are already reaching out to the different conferences, the SIAC, and getting everything approved. So on the HBCU level, we have a, a a body, a governing body there, and it's official within the leagues. Now the 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 problem here is just like Brian said, the HBCUs are slow getting into new technology and new ideas in general. So. You know, I, like I personally talked to a couple of HBCUs and we tried to get them into the program and it's sometimes it's like pulling teeth, but they are looking into like with the cancellation of sports and homecomings and all this stuff. They start looking into esports like, well, why can't we get in this esports space? And I'm like, you don't need nothing to get into it but a camera and some gamers. You already got that on your campus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So what you right, waiting right. for? Right? you missing you know what I'm out. Saying? Yeah, you're missing out. So um, there, like I said, the HBCU Esports League is, is happening. It's already happening right now. I think they have matches going this week. Um, they have uh, four different games they're doing, Call of Duty, uh, Rocket League, and two more games. I can't remember what they are, but it's happening right now. It's just the marketing behind it is not reaching a, a mass audience, and they're, they're still developing it, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's on the ground floor right now. I think they have five HBCU, HBCUs in it right now. Um, but you know, unfortunately, HBCUs do not have gaming programs baked into their curriculum yet. You know what I'm saying? But it's coming because some of these uh, uh, PWIs already have it. Georgia Tech, yeah. and they're um, building. You know, um, they're I'm building. Them, into it, bro. Yeah, they're building arenas and having teams, and they get into the money. You know what I'm saying? We need our, we black yeah. folks got to get in there. Huh? Like we can't be waiting, man. And you said something too. I want to just say. Representation is very important. Representation in all facets of it, not just development, but all facets of it. You know, and that that's how you push it forward. I say when I was in school, and it's a little known thing, when I was in school, 
I remember they came, I went to Albany State University. They came to our campus and they was trying to promote a game, it was doing one of our homecomings, promote a game like Madden. But the, the concept of it was, I don't know, it was like a game like Madden, but the concept was it was all HBCU teams, like a college football yeah. team. And yeah. then the halftime, this is what made it crazy with me. The halftime, you know how the, the, the HBCUs has this huge marching band tradition? Mm -hmm. They added that component in the game. And that was like on some uh, guitar hero type, you know, press the button. And, and you do these different uh, mm. mechanisms, and you, your, your. Not only would your school win, so you could lose the game, but you could have won the crowd with the with the wow. match event. Yep. So they they coined the black, and it didn't go anywhere because they was looking for support for it. But that you know, if they don't find feel like it's the market for it, they're not going to push it. So that's why I say all, to all the young gamers out there, just because you don't see yourself or you don't see a lot of them now, keep going because you might be that one. It's it's some it's some uh some black. Uh, uh, esports athletes that's killing it right now. So we just have to give, we have to create the platform to give them the tools like Brother KB was doing with, you know, showing that the personality and uh, streaming to, to kind of make it more popularized, make it more, and then the HBCUs will have to adopt it. You know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it's a big pot of money just sitting there and everybody else is, is dipping in it. And we got to figure out ways to, because the Hawks has, a, has an esports team. Like everybody's getting into it because they see the the money coming down the pipeline and we have to prepare our young kids. Like if they want to pursue that, give them as, you know, create these avenues for them to do so. Steve, like I'm, you glad you brought, I'm glad you brought that up because that was my game. And that I, was your game? And yeah. I want to answer this. Cause I remember, <laughs> I remember that, <laughs> that game, bro. bro. I remember, I remember that, game. that game, bro. bro. Yep. That was crazy. I was about to tell you, sure. I said that game came out cause I played it on the 360. Yep. Exactly. You remember was, that, man? Yeah, yeah, I remember. And I was so, it was, was the crazy. thing I loved about the game was that the models of all the stadiums, the HBU stadiums. Yes. Perfect. And I was like, wow. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's dope. Yeah, that's, that's dope, a bro. Howard man, a Howard man created that, right, Brian? Look at it, look at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh! Yeah. And uh, the CEO of the company was from Southern. Um, there were a couple other Howard grads. There was a Tuskegee grad. I mean, there was a, there was a whole bunch of people that went to HBCUs that were involved in the making bro, of that, that game. That was inspiring. Like, that That kind of, like, put that bug in me, like, to you know, to, to create, to do what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? Like, even if I if I tested it or tried it, but I could tell you being at homecoming and you see a game, you know, as much as we were playing, like, you know, Madden, Halo and all that stuff, but we was on it. To see a game that represented you was like crazy. You know what I mean? And and, and that planted a lot of different seeds. So that's why we got to keep it going. Like with talks like this to yeah. kind of like in the organizations that he mentioned, to, uh, to kind of keep those seeds planted so we can have a whole division because it's not a lot of representation as, as even like game concepts or game characters, you know what I mean? So they just now put in like customizable models that are more reflective of African-Americans, you know what I mean? Like with the hair and the face, they used to get on there, have to use the, the 2K camera and it still didn't look like, you, you know, so. <laughs> so that's why we need more of us in this industry uh, because it's money in it and it's, and it's bigger than that. Yes, sir. Question. Question. Um, in this moment in our history, with all that we see happening in terms of social justice work, how do we, how do you all, being in this industry, how do you see those of us who have been in the civil and human rights work, what can we do to help leverage this, this social justice moment so that we can um, add the diversity? How do we, how do we do that? Um, that partnership kind of work, right? Because because we see it, you know, we have entrepreneurs in our in our you know among us. We have brothers that are working in corporate America, um, and and when I when I talk to to lawyer groups, I'm telling them if if your Fortune 500 company that you are general counsel of, or if you work with a big law firm, whatever they offered you last year in terms of supporting your black initiative, make them give you 10 times that amount. <laughs> For real, it's, it's yeah. like, it, we got to, you know, this is a moment. We, we need, give up the resources. These are, you know, resources that, that you all jacked us for to begin with. Now you need to feed back into the community. How do we leverage this moment um, to, to help expand uh, obviously something all of you all love and a, a space that there is clearly a uh, a great future in is going to continue to grow, but we need to get, you know, our market share. 
Can I, can I answer that question? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I'm doing in Chicago is um, I, our, there's talent, there's obviously talent in our community. So we have to become executives of that talent. We have to point resources to that talent. We have to park outside those HBCUs and set up those, those systems that our young people can actually begin to exploit, uh, explore, create, and then monetize their talent. And so in, in, in Atlanta, we talking about like Pittsburgh, Mechanicsville. In Chicago, we talking about um, Inglewood and Austin. So we have to bring all of our skills and talents and begin to go into the community and build those systems. And then, because a lot of times those funding sources don't have, they really don't know what's happening on the ground. They wanna give, but they don't know how. If they give, it all goes to some of the major organizations, but it really doesn't trickle down to, to, to Pookie, Ray Ray, and Shaquan. We have to be the ones in the community to say, Shaquan and all the other people, yo, let's make this happen. We got to pull those resources and make sure that it's pointed directly at the, at the ones who need it the most. And so if we have outsiders coming into our community, even if they give us rep reparations, who is going to be the executives that's connected to the grassroots and young people on the ground that can actually... Um, give it to them properly or efficiently, make sure that money is spent efficiently. So we have to be the ones in the community kind of developing those systems so that when people choose to give, we make sure that it's given to the proper um, groups and make sure that it's, they get a, re we as a community get a return on that investment. I, I would agree with that so, uh, so much because Part of what I see on an everyday basis when I'm teaching a workshop or I'm, you know, trying to set something up for a virtual tournament for students, just straightforward. Our kids do not have access to the right type of equipment to really participate in esports. If you just keep it real, most of them do not have a high end computer at home. So the games that are paying the most to be a part of those communities, they most of our kids, they already blocked out of that. If you don't got a high end computer, you're not playing in the Overwatch League. You're not playing League of Legends. You're not playing CSGO. You're not playing Rocket League. You could just keep going down the list. And the reality is, is as much as I was a console kid growing up, right now you only have lucrative opportunities really maybe in the nba 2k league most of the games that you find competitive that you can have parity with you know so our kids could be playing the same thing anybody else is are fighting games and fighting games as much as i love and started my business my career in fighting games fighting games is not a, a lucrative way for me to tell a young person here's how you continue a professional career competing in these games so i mean to be honest i we could even go further than that and say they don't got the type of internet at home to really participate in these <laughs> things virtually we could talk about the digital divide from just merely a, an internet service provider aspect so you know we're looking at a few things that i think honestly we need to try to, from an equipment standpoint, just put these things in kids' hands. They need to sit down and put their hands on a high-end computer and see what the difference is between playing that versus the base console. Um, KB is so on point with talking about the streaming universe because so many of our kids got so much talent and bring so much flavor to that game. But they guess what? Anyway. You ain't going to make no money streaming directly from your PlayStation or Xbox. The people that's making big money in that industry have a high-end computer with a num with a number of different you know uh tools and resources to help them make it work so man I, I always try to keep it super simple the equipment we still lack in um the equipment that our kids need to kind of make you know good experiences out of this Kevin, what's a, what's a high-end com computer kevin what is so that? i'm i'm already talking about you got to have amd i mean or uh most people are probably more uh, more of our uh, our listeners may be familiar with intel intel core i pro core i pro core i7 processors are higher grab you have to have not an integrated graphics card you have to have a, a rtx any one of those br uh brands of, of of graphics card to even be kind of close to that type of and then most of us are playing video games Games on the television wrong wrong <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> you, don't high -end monitor. you need high a high-end monitor. Mo you need a high-end high monitor rate. high for refresh and mm -hmm. response rate so if you're not even doing those things 
you out the game. You're not even competing on the same level as anybody Kevin, else. Mm-hmm. Kevin, I want to say he's he's hitting it so right on this one. Uh, yeah. We have a our after school program, Steamship, uh, a couple years ago with uh, a partnership with uh, Camp Best Friends, who's at the Dunbar Center. And one of the first investments that I made um, was into a gaming computer. Um, and I had to buy a laptop so I can take it to the different centers. And I'm sitting yep. in front of it right now. Um, and the laptop, like he said, I have the i7. Um, I have the Infinity. I have, I have the, uh, the graphics card. Um, and it's an MSI. Most people don't even know what an MSI is. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and just bringing it to the center because I wanted to do a VR setup. Um, and, and that was with the HTC Vive. So I had to bring the poles and everything. And we took it there, and the kids were able to see, you know, in the in, in their computer lab, which didn't work. Just said. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you just spoke, bro, you might as well be speaking straight. Right. Okay, okay. You know right. what? You thank, like, you, thank you for that Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's basically, it's, I bought a high-end laptop, gaming laptop, uh, to their facility so we can do virtual reality. And the kids got a blast out of it. Yeah. So what he's saying about investing in the tools or is correct. Let these kids build their own gaming PC. And he mentioned the internet. For those who don't know, if your internet is basic, you're 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 going to suck. Your performance you out the game. Suck. Out you the out game. the game because that character they can they can pull the trigger a lot faster than you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They can. It's it's just a different experience. So one of the blessings of the esports arena is that it levels the playing field as far as physical ability. Now it's about strategy. It's about reflex. But if you don't have the equipment to even get it stand in a room with them, uh, that's why a lot of these 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 companies sponsor the equipment because they know like, all right, you have all the talent in the world, but if you if you're on a, a sucky Wi-Fi or like you, you don't if you just just not having the best uh, performance equipment, you're gonna lose, take a L every time. So mm-hmm. invest it in the in the gatekeepers who know what to get, who can teach the kids how to build their own gaming computer and how to upgrade it and how that's that's invaluable skills in a sense right there. And you, know, you don't even need education. You just need to be able to Amazon, look, Google some stuff, go to mm-hmm. Micro Center, pick out the parts you want. And you can build a, a, a powerful gaming PC on a budget and play these games. And because everything he said was correct. Yeah. And you can you can uh be in competition and, and that'll open the whole world with you. So yeah, investing in these gatekeepers that do the work and help making sure that they have the because a lot of these, you know, rec centers that these these communal places these kids go to um have the like they have like the basic of basic computers you know what i mean and like, be trying to say hop on yeah. wi-fi hop on yeah, wi-fi like, and terrible. they got one access point yeah. underneath somebody's <laughs> desk okay, ain't nobody ain't nobody terrible. connected to no end of that uh, your latency and i think once again kids will have fun learning about these terms mm-hmm. and terminology around yeah, internet technology mm-hmm. process and they'll have so much fun because we're not talking down to them for a change mm-hmm. we're talking about something they want to hear about and we making them better in the space man so mm-hmm. i'll even tell you if you at the crib and you got a man Man cave and your wife got the access point upstairs. Well, you lose them, brother. You yeah. you not <laughs> man, you no esports. That's yeah, not you what you doing. Doing. If, if, it ain't, if it ain't to plug directly into it, you lose yeah, it, you, lose like, it. You, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, Kevin. Yeah. Kevin, I want to do a, a quick little thing. We was talking about um, how resources not being available, and I'm just I'm just talking at the point of being in down in Southwest Georgia before my mom passed. She worked with the Boys and Girls Club, and it was almost you know times where I would go down there to see her when she was working there. It was almost disheartening to show the <laughs> the disconnection between how they treated blacks in boys and girls club areas versus the whites and i i kid you not everyone i literally went to that facility they actually had machines in there where they asked they, one of the the um the um the, the uh, monitors the person that ran that facility she knew the idea with computers she said sam could you come check some of our computers and i literally went there and they actually had machines in there that had windows 95 on the machine, and you and was, was like, like you said, "Is this a museum?" <laughs> and and you was like, like, "Oh, this is a nice museum." I'm like, what, what is this? And, is it, nice. and it and it and it got to the point. I really realized that these were this this how disenfranchised they were doing some of the black the black um boys and girls club. They would give them their location hand me downs of older machines, and then you go across town to the newer facilities that become in the in the white Platinum. neighborhood. 
they got they got I, I some universities HBCUs don't even have I nines in, in their labs, and they got they in the boys and gloves. They got I nine machines, so that's where I think a lot of the resources is and, and stuff needs to be put. That money is distributed equally, mm-hmm. and and it makes I mean because it doesn't make a sense. You gonna have this all the facilities, but everybody don't, everybody every facility is not on the same equal playing field. Man. And brothers. I was going to say um, for the brothers, one mm-hmm. of my most popular classes, and you know, I teach elementary and high school technology. One of my most popular classes was my computer build and repair. So I mm-hmm. actually taught them how to build a gaming system. Yep. For my kids who they say ADHD, I put them over the corner. I give them a, a task to do, take this computer apart, put it back mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. That's, that's uh, what do you call it? Um, behavior control. That's how I control behavior. I find the kids who can't sit still. I give them a computer, take it apart, put it, and I give them an incentive for doing so. And say so that's how you control behavior. The classroom management is what I call it. Mr. Young, Mr. Young, I, yeah. uh, I had a similar thing. I had, had a group of, I just want to say during the summer program, we had a group of guys that was like hyperactive. So oh, yeah. I brought in, I brought in a couple old laptops, right? Yeah. And you see, I, what I told I gave them the tools, and I just told them, strip it down. Strip, strip it, down. it down. They had that thing on bricks. They had the hard drive. <laughs> they just had the Wi-Fi camera. <laughs> they, they, I'm talking about, and it was, and I, and I look over there, and I see them trying to figure it out. I didn't give them any instruction just to strip it down, take it apart as much as you can. And after they took it apart, we start going through the parts of it. And I was like, well, you know, that's actually some money. That's a hard drive. You could turn it into an external hard drive. And, yeah. and see how many gigs that is? Look it up online and see how many gigs that, uh, see how much uh, a hard drive goes for that many gigs. And then it turned out, the light bulb went off and they start bringing me parts. Like, how much can I get for this? How much, <laughs> like, <laughs> but the interest was there and they were mm-hmm. set there and they focused and they figured out how to properly, like the thin ribbon cables, how to take those out without breaking them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Sometimes um, you just got to let them get in and, and let them have access to yes. it, even if they're going to mess it up. Just, you know, it's, it's yes. just putting them, putting their hands on it mm-hmm. opens yes. the po- world of possibilities for them. But they had that thing on bricks and it was like in like 25, less than 25 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and I do that with cell phones. So I have them research the specs on the cell phone. What mm-hmm. type of cell phone do you have? Why are you paying $300, $400 for a cell phone? Tell me what you're getting for that $300, yep. $400. Yep. And that's a... That's a um, class. That's a lab. Mm-hmm. So I keep them engaged. Yes, brother. And I, I can I go ahead, brother. I know you, I know you want to move on, <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, that was a good question too. Um, but I think like something we could do to help push it forward. I think is like normalize, normalize gaming. Like, don't mm-hmm. think of it as, oh, this is this big huge thing to make a game. It's it's not. It's not. Don't think of it like that. We got to we got to normalize that. Like, don't look at a gamer like, oh, you a gamer? Like, oh, that's weird or that's this. That's no, we need to normalize it because in the black community, we don't we don't look at it and embrace it and say, oh, that's dope, bro. Like, oh, keep that going. Like, we need to make that thing cool. You know what I'm saying? Well, that brother, brother KP, that's that is actually a good lead into what the Black Man Lab is about. Right. We. We're, we're talking about gaming tonight, but we've had, well, we talked about the medical industry. We've talked about various industries. And I think a lot of times in our communities, what we see is that disconnect of our young folks saying, well, that can't be me, right? But as you guys talk about this, and especially for Molly, and I'll speak for him, because we don't know, we're not in the gaming industry, we may know a little bit here and there, but it's really normalized. This conversation tonight has really normalized a lot of it. For, for me um, and realizing that there's great opportunity um, for, for everybody. Uh, we, we're way over time, by the yeah. way, guys. We're way past uh, where we should be, but Ali and I didn't really want to stop the conversation because it's been so rich and so so passionate. And um, our folks need to see that. They need to see that, that this is a, something that they are very capable of, of achieving themselves. Um, but what we do, one of the things that we do every week is we ask, um, what are your habits, rituals, and disciplines that you do on a daily basis that keep you keep you centered and keep you moving and doing whatever work that you're doing? And we ask that because we know that um, none of this work that, that we do uh, is is just given to us. We know that it's done through 
um, being centered, and then also through our practices that we do on a regular basis. So um, if you could answer that question for us really quick, because again, we're way over time, but we would really like to hear what each of you all's habits, rituals, and disciplines are that you do on a daily basis. Rolling. And um, I'll ask my, my bison brother, uh, Brian Jackson, could you start with start and give your uh, your habits, rituals, and disciplines? Sure. Um, real quick, I have a, um, a thing I call a, day, a daily motivation. And every job that I've ever had, I've had it posted up. The first thing you see when you walk into my office at work. And it reads, daily motivation, design the way, drive a shared vision, challenge a process, enable others to create, and encourage the passion. And I say that because if I say that every day, then that means I'm doing something for somebody else to get them more enthused about what they're doing. And whenever I go to uh, job fairs and I, or I talk to kids about the video game industry, the first thing I ask them is, how many of you all play video games? They all raise their hand. And I said, what if I told you that you could get paid to play video games? And they look at me like, that's crazy. They, they had not even thought, never even think about that being a process. So again, you know, if I can design the way to make things better, if I can drive a shared vision of, of the collective people that I'm working with, if I can challenge a process to make it better, if I can enable others to create and come up with their own ideas and to push their ideas. And the biggest thing though, is to encourage the passion. If you, if, if your child is interested in being an artist, there's so many different ways they can get into the video game industry just based on art alone. They can be a concept artist. They can be a texture modeler. They can be um, an animator. I mean, there's, there's so many different things just from liking one small specific part of the video game industry. That's awesome. Thank you, brother. Um, brother Sam, how about you? Habits, rituals, and disciplines. Well, I say one of my biggest habits has been over the over these forty years is actually talking tech with friends. It's I mean every day I have a friend. Actually, the whole time we was on the, we've been on li been live, he's been calling me. We daily talking about anything dealing with gaming, gaming and tech, and that's like always been a ritual these, all these years. You know, conversating with them, even um, Stephen can talk. We've been we've been been talking for over the years about what new techs and what comes out, picking each other's brains. And even once I get to work in my office, I have a lot of different um, emails and conversations that pop up my email. I'm reading back what's new, what's coming out new in VM where what's new coming out in am animation what new tech is coming out in the world and it was just ritual things i do to start my throughout the day and how i start my my morning when i go I, mean, when I go live in office basically yours is you are what you what you're doing on a daily basis constantly trying to take in and learn new information as it relates to the industry right all the time because if anybody anybody sits there and says that they know everything about this arena they're lying to their self <laughs> awesome <laughs> Good stuff. Brother Steven, how about you? Uh, one of the things that I've adopted recently is I read a passage. Out of, so you always have to read. You have to stay in a mode of learning, always learning, like Sam, Sam said, uh, and especially in the direction that you want to go to. Lawyers, you guys have to surround yourself with being an ecosystem where law is present so you can absorb it, you know, passively or directly. Um, I'm, read, I'm re reading this book, uh, The Daily Stoic, and it's just a page a day, um, and it talks about different things. Uh, but one of the things that I've, uh, one of the, I guess, the rituals is I wake up thankful. I, I, when I get up, I, I think, you know, I take count and I'm, I, I say it to myself, how, what I'm thankful for, uh, my family, my life, my, you know, whatever. Um, and I'll just leave with this. Uh, for those young people, if you have a goal, one of, the, one of the, the hacks that you can do for yourself is change one of your passwords to what your goal is. And you have to, you can program yourself that way. So every time you log on to Instagram, if your goal is, uh, if your goal is to, to learn coding or ask that teacher for that or look for this program, change one of your passwords to that. So every time you have to log in, it's going to force you to remember it. And that's something that, that's been working for me for years. Uh, I can't tell you all what mine is now, but, um, you know, every, every so often I do it and, it and then all of a sudden it becomes easier and easier and easier. And, you know, that, that law of attraction. So that's that's something that you guys can do. Just change one of your passwords to one of your goals. It can be simple. It can be. John, it can be big and just, you know, keep doing it, keep doing it until you have it and then change it to the next goal. So that's one of the, the things I'm going to leave with you guys. Awesome. Appreciate can it. I, can I go next? Cause I'm a whole, I got to host a tournament in about five minutes. Yep. Go. All right. So the two things that I do every day, Flipboard and Kickstarter, 
I love hearing about new ideas. That's how I keep myself fresh on what people are thinking about on the industry. A lot of fun to read these articles about what people are thinking about is new and creative and possible in video games. And then the next thing, man, I, I tell my students all the time, man, I keep it simple. My clients know that I play games every single day. And um, playing games is not only fun, but it keeps me up to date on the machines, the updates, the patches, all of that. And it makes me incredibly relatable when I need to uh, set something up for people. So, Awesome. Appreciate that. Um, who did I miss here? Thank you to you, brother KB. I still need to go. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know if I do this every day, but I'll, I try to infect the people around me. Like I try to always have a conversation about gaming. Like if you talk to any of my coworkers at my job, I do software development. They know that, oh, he for real want to be playing games right now. They know I'm in the gaming industry. They know that I, that's, that's my passion. So I talk, even I talk to my friends. I'm like, hey, man, you want to join me on the stream and we can do something. So I started a, pla I started a platform around two bad gamers. So I get two bad gamers and we'll, we bad, but we'll play a game that we don't know. And that exposes a new game and it's just kind of fun to do. Another thing I do, I try to create content around gaming. You know, so so I, every anything I'm good at, I try to like, okay, what do I love? What's the cross section of that? And that's mainly what I do. Like that's how I create all the content that I do. Awesome, appreciate that, brother Zaki. How about you? Um, one of the things that I always do is just work talking to brothers like you all here tonight. Um, I, I talk to my adults and my brothers, my friends. I be like, well. I, I, I live by this old African proverb that says that when the children, when the village children, when the children in the village are not being nourished and neglected, they return to turn, they return to burn the village down. And so as, as adult men, as mentors, as, as keepers of, of the village of our communities and protectors, we have to make sure that we surround ourselves by as many young people as possible and give them that nourishment so they don't return to burn the village down. And second thing is we know that within our community, that's where all the talent is in the hood. We have to go in and become executives of the talent. Stop being the talent and become the executive. You should be at the top of the pyramid when it comes to our talent. We're surrounded by talent. We need to be the ones either monetizing it or showing the community how to, to monetize it and allow, and stop allowing others to come into our community and exploit our resources. And that, that's, what, that's what I live by. Thank you, brothers. Brothers, we, we, we have a tradition that we close out. So we're gonna ask you all to take yourselves off of mute. And this was given to us by one of our queen mothers here in the Atlanta metro area by Queen Mother Injiri Algani. And anytime we were in a room and we would gather, at the close of that gathering, she would always have us either clutch hands or lock arms. And so we're gonna ask y'all to lock arms with us right now, because what she was very clear about is that now that you've come into this space, that you're a part of this space and we're connected. And she was all about helping us connect one to another and remaining connected, not for a moment, but for a lifetime. Because we know that even in the pouring of libations, we remain connected to our ancestors and those that will come after us if we do honorable work and show good character. And so we ask you to repeat after us, I am a link in this chain. I am a link in this chain. chain. And it won't break here. And it won't, it won't break, break here. here. I am a link in this chain. I am I'm a link in this chain. chain. And it won't break here. And it, and won't, it won't, won't break, break here. here. We are links in this chain. We, we are, are links, are links in, in this chain. chain. And we won't break here. And we won't, we break, won't break, break here. Break here. I I share. Share. Brothers, I thank you so much. Thank you for all this rich conversation. If you haven't done it, please make sure you drop your information in the chat so we have you locked in. Um, and again, we always say every week, uh, although we're doing this virtually, at some point we will be back in person together and we would invite you all into the space because um, we know that you have a lot to offer to our young folks and we would love to have you there. Thank you again, man. And, and, and this has been far more of a richer conversation than we could have ever imagined. 
Um, and I, I would hope that our young folks out there uh, will realize that they have within them this high level of creativity that we have as Black people, um, creativity and innovation. And that fits this mode. That fits what we're talking about tonight. So thank you so much again. All right, peace. Peace, fam. Thank you, brother. Right, everybody be good. Hey, All right. man. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate you.